He's also one of the founding members of the University of Cape Town Surgical Society. Today we'll be asking him questions about how the Surgical Society came to be, questions about his career path, and gaining nuggets of wisdom from him. Alright, so we're just going to ask you a couple of questions about uh, sure. the founding of uh, SurgSoc. Yep. So how were you involved in UCT SurgSoc? Look, um, I've said this in many interviews before, in, in 2005 and 2006, um, there was a lot of news, uh, particularly in the South African General Surgery, that was looking at the um, need for general surgeons in the country. Um, at that point, uh, many of the programs felt that they did not have enough applicants. In fact, some of the programs up north were recruiting uh, registrars or residents, whatever you call them now, um, from overseas to fill in those posts. Okay. Um, in our class, we had a number of uh, girls and boys who were interested in surgery, um, had a common passion for the field, uh, and we initially started with an interest group um, where we would get together and try to put together a program um, for the students uh, in their undergraduate years. Um, eventually, uh, the idea came up that we should start a formal surgical society, so we approached um, uh, the relevant divisions on upper campus, um, we wrote the constitution for the society, um, which then uh, led up to the formal establishment of the society in 2000, and uh, actually it started in 2005, but it's really in 2006 that we really got it uh, formally going with the university. So I'm going to say it was really a, you know, today we, we formally call this global surgery, so for me, this was a, a global surgery initiative very early on, um, um, you know, when global surgery was not, not even a movement. You yeah. Know, then, yeah. So I think that's why we started. I think we felt that uh, it, would make, it would contribute to some change nationally. Um, but also, if at no point um, during this, uh, you know, this journey had we thought that we should be convincing people to do surgery, Right. What we thought we should be doing is enlightening people. So telling people what surgery is about, um, telling people what has been done in the country at the moment, what has been done overseas, what are the possibilities, and you know, what will surgery look like in 20 years or 30 years? You know, what I thought about surgery as a student is now completely different. You know, and I don't think I had a had in that little extra perspective of, of what, what uh, surgery would, would be like in the future. Um, you know, the other idea was to just get together, mm -hmm. you know, going to university is one of the most important things about going to university is, become, is that you have to become a valuable member of society. Um, it's, it's actually in the guidelines of our institution, right? Okay. So it says one of, you, must, you must become a valuable member of society and be able to contribute you know, to the bigger picture of your country, and we felt by doing that uh, somewhere, it will be help the helping hand uh, to achieve that. So you said that it was a, a group of students of you, yep. but was there any initial conversations of maybe one or two of you that said, "Hey, let's start a, a society," or was it like just to happen that a group of you ended up talking about it? So, so I think there there were about four or five of us who, you know, got together in in the beginning. I mean, I remember approaching. Uh, Richard Spence, who, you know, we were at medical school together, um, we did registrar time together, we actually did fellowship time in Canada together, and um, he's, you know, he's now, you know, he's now chosen to, to um, continue his career overseas, and he's quite a well, you know, is, um, established global surgery personality at such a young age. Um, look, I, I always say I was part of the, I was a founding member. I really say I was the founder because I, you know, my personal feeling is that we would never been able to put this together mm -hmm. if we were not a, a good group or a good team, right. you know. So we had a, it was a common thread, a common feeling, a common thought that we, we had. 
as a as a founding committee that led to uh, you know the establishment of the society. But yes, obviously, every single committee member had a, a strength or could do something different uh, within our team, which I think was really helpful. Um, some of us just had great ideas, but um, others were extremely good at making those ideas happen. Okay. And other members were extremely good at making a, a good event happen, which was very, very important earlier on. You know, I was saying in the first meeting which we organized, um, in a, it was quite a nice hotel. There were only about three or four. Yeah, the hotel. There were okay. only three or four students that came, um, and, and I thought that was the end of it. Uh, but then, you know, we, we we caught momentum as we went, and I said, you know, by the time we left, we were about six hundred members, which was well established. Right. So we, had, we had enough funding. You know, there were many months. I'll be honest, and I'm ready to say that in ca on camera. There were many times when we organised. The, the, uh, the societal events um, that our funding wouldn't come through. Uh, it would just happen. The funding wouldn't come through or there would be a glitch in the paperwork. And what we do is most of us had jobs within the committee. I mean, I had a job as a, as a sub warden, eventually a warden, and others were, had jobs on the side. We were just pitching our money together and get something going. And the Department of Surgery was also always forthcoming. They would contribute a significant amount and just make the event happen. Um, now I understand that it's cash flow is much better. It's much better run. Um, and I said it early on, um, the success of the society is based on its leadership and its following, obviously. But uh, wherever you are in the society, you must just make sure, and it's difficult, if you have a the least surgical acumen within you, you'll realize that ego is the, it's the most difficult thing to manage within every surgeon or and lots of doctors as well. You know, and for us, one of the most important things is, you know, we decided earlier on that when we choose the next committee, right. we chose one before we left, uh, we would make sure that they would be a thousand times better than us. It would be brighter than us, sharper than us, better looking than us, and they would do a better job than us, you know. And the the other the other you know thing that we the other issue that most of us agreed upon was that we would never get involved again. Okay. So we would not be involved as patrons or you know advisory members. Although it was on the cards initially, with we we felt that would be the way to go. So we'd step away completely. If the phone is for advice, we would give advice, but we would not be involved. Right. If the society had to fail and dwindle away that way, you know, then uh, there was a likelihood that would happen. Mm -hmm. but, but we also thought by taking that risk, or calculated risk, um, whoever took the society later on would do a better job than us. And I'm, I'm so happy that actually that happened. Um, I remember having these conversations with Prof. Barnway, you know, he ask whether there would be something, you know, there would be life after we left, um, but there was so much of interest amongst medical students, right. it was, uh, for us, I mean, from our point of view, we might have been a bit younger and naive at that point, but uh, we felt that uh, there was enough, of, you know, there was enough quality amongst the medical students to keep this going, and to make it better, much better than what it was. I mean, it's actually quite motivating to know, like, the initial founders, you guys actually put, like, your own hard own money into the side just to keep it running. Yeah. And also managed to taking that risk. It actually it's like it's quite a quite a gamble. It is, I, I mean say. it's calculated risk. Yeah, yeah. Like everything in surgery. You oh, know, that's okay. what I tell patients. You know, it's really calculated risk. Um, you know for, there are many days when I walked back from here right. to Clarendon House, I thought this would be the last meeting. Okay. Yeah, there are many days when that happened, especially in the beginning. It was uh, it was really hard. I mean, on, on the day before the event, you would go to upper campus because nothing was really electronic in those days, right. and try and get you know an invoice signed, and they would tell you, "Sorry, your actually your membership fees for last year didn't come in." So none of the six or two, three hundred members who had signed it, none of the monies came in. Wow. 
life. And that's so then we would on. quickly try and put something together, go to Professor Khan for the partner surgery, and it would work out. But the one common thing we had, you know, throughout all these hassles, once the society really got going, was that we had interested, an interested audience. At one point, we had people coming from other campus, from philosophy, from the arts, who were interested. Because what we did is we, we did these talks that were quite general. Mm. So we would talk about some of the most uh, advanced procedures being done, not because they were fancy, but because they brought a new perspective of surgery. So we would discuss, one of them would be face transplantation. And I remember Kevin Adams, who's now a plastic surgeon at the university, gave this talk. And we, we, you know, we did these talks because they were surgically interesting. Right. But they were, it was news in society. I mean, nobody understand, at that point, nobody really understood how you know, people would view this as a procedure, and it brought a lot of debate in this very lecture theatre. It brought a, sometimes quite feisty, which was nice. It brought a lot of debate about these procedures and you know whether we should offer them a lot or not, and and it sparked a lot of interest, which I would say, and it encouraged or discouraged people from doing surgery, whichever it was. The fact that it, for me, the fact that it brought some valuable debate at our institution was, you know. For me, we had achieved our goal. Then right. good, yeah. And then also, like you said, that what in, inspired you basically was just trying to get people interested in the field and have a common ground between people who enjoyed surgery and global surgery and how you wanted to see where it goes in 20 to 30 years. But what else also you think could have inspired you to have started a society other than, other than those particular goals? Uh, I'm sure if you ask any every single member of the founding committee, they will tell you it's mentorship. And I think it's mentorship within the Department of Surgery. Uh, I, I don't think that's changed a lot over the years in a good way. We've always had great mentors in the department, all those great surgeons you can you know, knock at their doors and get some advice, whether it's personal, professional, what you plan to do in your career. Um, for me personally, it was because of Del Khan, uh, Professor Khan. I, I don't think I would be here today without him, and many of us in the committee feel the same. And I met him coincidentally in the trauma unit, um, assisted, him in, assisted him with the transplant operation. You know, and here we are, I would say, how many years now? 14, 15 years later, I am a trained transplant surgeon, um, and it's because of him. Um, but uh, I, I, I have no doubt when I say it is mentorship. I really hope that this institution keeps on uh, uh, building on that, you know. I'll be honest, I, I still phone, he's not retired, but I still phone Professor Khan for advice. Okay. Career advice, whether I'm making the right choice about a job or whether this you think this is valuable research, I should pursue this. Um, and I always get very good advice. Uh, you know, for me, that's, uh, you can't get there, you can't get that anywhere else, yeah. I think, in the country. I think. I think overseas, when I went, it was a, it was a different flavor. Um, you can see that mentorship is well, you know, it's well bolted into, into each and every program. Um, obviously, you have good mentors, you have bad mentors, and then you have unique, phenomenal mentors. Mm -hmm. And I think at this institution, we have the chance to have that. And I think that's one of the main pillars of the Surgical Society. The establishing the Surgical, the surgical Society is, as with mentorship, I would say. Yeah. That's quite good to know. And then, so like you said, like all of this kind of helped you with your career um, trajectory, like meeting other surgeons, um, becoming quite good acquaintances with them. And you feel as though like everybody, like, like you said, every, everybody in the, in, in the society kind of felt the same way. But was there any other benefits that you found that by creating this um, society mm -hmm. has helped you over the years? Mm. I, th I think it's the, uh, you know, there's this famous saying, it's, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, that hasn't changed over the years. You know, and for me, one of the, uh, I think we made a significant number of international contacts when we, uh, when we started with the society. We had international guests speaking. Um, we had 
national. We had people who flew down. We flew, in those days, I remember that first guest we flew down from Johannesburg was Prof Ken Bofard. He's got a world-renowned trauma surgeon. Um, and at a very young age, can reasonably engage with his people. Not from a surgical perspective, because right. at that point you know nothing, or the very strict minimum, but as an individual or a, you know, a budding surgeon, I think it, it adds great value, and you get, you get great advice. Mm-hmm. You know. I'll give you one classic example was where should I go for community service? Uh, and for me, I went to the community service in Kimberley because I knew of a good mentor there. I knew about somebody who cared about training people who were fresh out of internship, who would get them to a reasonable level for the next step of their career, and I met that person through Surgical Society. So for me, making contacts, uh, you know, with, with you know relevant people, relevant institutions, happened like this. And it, you know, the other important thing is, is um, you know, particularly when you're in the committee or you you're involved, right. you know, with whatever part you're doing in the society part of the audience, you spark a debate by asking a question. If you're part of the committee and your duty on the day is to make sure that the coffee is hot and that there's enough for everybody. Or if you're part of the, uh, if you're the treasurer, you're going to make sure that money has been spent well and wisely within the society. Or if you run a relevant subcommittee on mentorship or research. Or if you're the leader of the surgical society and you you know, you, your job is to, you know, in French we say a bon pas, which means uh, you have to take it, you're going to make sure that you sail your ship to correct right safely to the right harbour. Uh, I think everybody gathers, gains a bit of, of, of experience in something. Um, and that little bit of experience is, will become relevant, right. even if you choose a non surgical career. You often find a lot of students who finish medical school and who are very bright, very good, but then who kind of struggle to find their way or get into the system or get into a specialty. I just feel that if you're involved in something, it mustn't be surgical society, it's something, some committee right. at res, some activity at university, you're kind of much more prepared, you know. Basically, that valuable experience. That yeah, I think life experience is so important. Right. It's often, it's the most undervalued commodity at university, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody wants to do well, which is great, but everybody who gets into medical school is bright. Right. You know, we, you know, we all quantify candidate. We all grade candidates according to their marks, or they've done extremely well in high school. Or, look, I went to a very non-traditional school. I. You know, I was educated and I went to high school in Mauritius, the public school, extremely competitive, but I missed on many things in life, you know, some of the more, the more sports or debating, um, you know, so a number of the social activities that private schools offer, I wasn't really exposed to, but uh, when you come to medical school, you quickly realize that and it's important to do that because Often what will happen is, I'm not sure if it's a good or bad thing, medical students are extremely self-critical. Okay. Oh, it's, very, it's very important to realize that every single medical student is extremely self-critical. Whether they get a mark mm-hmm. below the top candidate or whatever your, your, your standards you've set, you, you've underperformed, you're extremely critical. Better, you want to try and get it right. Um, it's also important for you to understand that uh, one day when you apply for a job or you aim for a career or a bigger job, you know the marks are, are part of it, but but they're unfortunately not enough. You know, you, you, we should have seen your face somewhere else if we want to recruit you. Your involvement, you know, how you engage with society, how you talk, how you can convince people. So, you know, it's being a surgeon these days is is not only about operating. You know, you often have to run a division, you have to run a unit. You 
have to run a specific clinic within many many challenges mm -hmm. you know as you know we're a country that faces you know numerous economic and, and, and infrastructural challenges we can see that but it doesn't mean that we can't provide a world-class service and to do that we have to be inventive right mm -hmm. and if you've just stuck to the books the whole time you you cannot become you really have to be a good rounder, a good all rounder, and know, you know, what battles to fight um, and how to improve things. I think. Okay, and then also, um, what was your biggest highlights in Third Song? What do you think? Um, yeah, I think my biggest highlight mm -hmm. would, without a doubt, is when I see the you know society winning everything, best committee, you know best run society, largest society on campus. Um, seeing that a lot of the, certainly not me, a lot of the leaders, the, you know the the, the uh, leaders of the committees or the presidents winning world scholarships, um, establishing themselves solidly in their career afterwards, um, and seeing that the society is still alive. I think in the moment when we established it, a lot of the stuff was really blurry because you were just, we were trying to survive. Hello. That's, you know, that first, the first four months, you know, we just wanted to make sure that we survive, that there's something, that there's a structure, that it functions, that people try and attend. Um, and if we get, you know, somewhere there's a little voice inside the us, we were gonna get past that. Um, and to make sure that it grows over the years, you know. If there was no legacy to this, we wouldn't be having this conversation right sure. here, yeah, yeah. right? And none of this would have been worth it, right? The fact that there's a legacy for me is the biggest success. For me, that's the highlight. There's no other highlight. And that we did great things during our tenure or that we had great membership numbers and when we left, it was really solid. Yeah, these were successes. Right. But the highlight is, without a doubt, is the legacy we've left and what, what the society has become. The society could function on its own now. We don't need much help, right? The society could function quite independently. Um, you know, and uh, you know, even if the leadership is not that great, the structure is on, you know, in place. Mm. That uh, in such good condition that it would be an autopilot. It would run smoothly. Right. You would get through the storm. And then when you have a stronger committee, you know, you, you could make some improvements. Uh, but for me, I've only seen that every year the committee gets better. So when you leave one day, the committee that you put in there must be 10, 20 times better. Right. And that must be the job of the future committee as well. Basically constantly building the foundation. Yeah, you must have a, you know, it's the most important thing is that you, you have, you mentor the right people. Mm. You know, when we left, we had uh, we'd identified a candidate uh, who was in their second year of medical school, and people were laughing. So it's a joke, you know. So we had an eye on this person, and we thought that in three years' time, when we leave, he will be ready to become vice president, and then a year later, he'll become president. That person became a Rhodes Scholar. Sure. Okay. Tinashe Chandaki, he became a Rhodes Scholar eventually. Um, and he's going to embark on a surgical career suit. Um, but he, he made big changes in the society. And they need to do that vision. So you need to identify from early on. And it doesn't matter whether they don't become, uh, it doesn't matter whether they choose a career other than surgery afterwards. The important thing is that they have the uh, Afrikaans to say oomph. You know, and they have that fire within them to carry on and to, to improve the society. That's what I think. Perfect. Thank you so much. Good. Okay, um, for this part, we're just going to be asking you a few questions about your profession. Um, and firstly, I'm just like to know, like, what was your journey like after med school? Okay, so I think my journey into uh, surgery really started during med school. I, uh, one night I decided to go to the trauma unit and uh, to see what it was like. I've never seen a gunshot or stabbing and I heard we were quite a busy place. So I went there and uh, it was on a Friday night, close to midnight time, 
met this uh, saw this gentleman standing with a black suit, white uh, shirt, quite well dressed, and I thought it must be the funeral services. Convinced, just it's the, the traditionally there at that time of the night, the significant mortality associated with the trauma. And we started talking, and I quickly realized I was speaking to the head of surgery. He told me he was here to re retrieve organs as a potential donor, and that he would be doing a transplant in the morning if everything went through, and he would be in theater number seven, as far as I remember, 10 o'clock in the morning, the next morning. I'm welcome to come and assist because he has no available assistance. So I did that and then scrubbed in and I did a lot of effort. I kind of assisted him and uh, he did a kidney transplant, which I thought was, you know, it was really mind blowing. You're still quite young in your career, you've never seen any surgery before, and somebody shows you how to do a kidney transplant. Um, and then the next day I went and I looked at the patient in high care, found my way to the hospital. See the patient's making urine. So I, I probably saw all of this in a very simplistic way at that time. Um, then eventually, you know, I don't know if it's fake or destiny, but Professor Khan became my mentor. Um, and looked after me until I finished medical school, um, and then until I decided to come back here and pursue my, my training. So I had quite a scenic journey. I think a lot of me. Other registrars here have done the same, but it's been a number of years outside of an academic hospital. So, I two years of internship in a small regional hospital in Porchester in the south coast of Natal. I did a year of community service in general surgery in Kimberley. I then went back to Porchester as a what we call a senior house officer for a year and a half. And then came back to Kimberley. I did general surgery for five years. Um, and after board certified in general surgery and spent some time in the trauma unit as uh, what we call here as a junior consultant surgeon. I did that for two years. Um, and I certainly had an interest in, I did, had a, I'm going to call it a hybrid interest in, in, in transplantation and vascular surgery. So I went over to Toronto and I did a, a multi organ transplant fellowship in, uh, in liver, kidney, and pancreas transplantation. Um, and after that, I came back to Cape Town to join the uh, Division of uh, General Surgery and the Vascular Surgery Unit as a, as a fellow. Now, my my long-term plan is to, to uh, you know, establish hybrid vascular and transfer surgery in the country, uh, but also to provide, uh, I think, world-class service if we can to our patients uh, at, a, at a very cost-effective price. That's very important for us to understand that in our context. What, what was it, would you say, um, kind of developed your interest in transplant, transplant surgery? Um, I'm going to say it's mentorship. I keep saying that word the whole time is because I had a great mentor who had a, a lifelong interest in the field. For me, that was one of the things that kind of fostered my interest in more and more transportation. But also the uh, it's one of those very few surgeries where people uh, come to you when they are about to make a, a, a really life-changing um, decision. They, they come to you very sick and they will probably not live the next few weeks, if not days, um, of, of, of their remaining lifetime. And, you know, it's at that point where they are offered an organ transplant. And, you know, once that happens, when you see the patients in the ICU or in the eye care, and you see them 15, 20 days later, it's incredible. Um, they, in fact, have been given a, a, a new life. Um, they can be active in society again, they can look after the family. It's all been looked after their families uh, for a very, very long time. Uh, for me, the other thing was the you know, instant impact uh, you make on these patients uh, once you do a transplant. But uh, you know, obviously, the transplant goes well, but it is really challenging surgery with you know, a high degree of mobility and mortality to start with. Uh, so, yeah, I would say it was you know, mentorship, impact you have on the patients, 
And obviously the new things that are happening in transplant surgery when it comes to uh, surgical technique, better inner suppression. Now patients who are living 10, 15 years after a liver transplant, you know, uh, with minimal inner suppression. Something we wouldn't really have imagined about 10, 15 years ago. So you know, I think that really, that's really what drew me to Surgery. And from a technical point of view, you know, I just have an interest in doing vascular osmosis for someone. He said that's why I went to vascular surgery or transplant surgery. But eventually, I thought doing a hybrid career would what would suit me. Many people might disagree. You know, that's uh, that's the nature of the game. But there are many centres where you go where people are duly qualified. Particularly in India, you go to New Zealand, Australia, where people are duly qualified in vascular surgery. Practice the trade. Um, you mentioned that um, that you had some patients on the on the on the good and the, the highs of the career. Um, what other highs and lows do you kind of experience? So I think the highs are you know, getting into that fellowship for me was one of the highs. Getting selected it's extremely hard to match there. It's a very famous fellowship. The largest program was actually the largest liver transplant program in North America. You know, you know, getting in there was for me was some high point of career. Um, and the lows were numerous. There are often a thousand lows and one high in this career. This is the nature of the game, it is what it goes, you know. So well, Sunday you have good days in the OR, and other days you have very bad days in the some days you feel that you're on the top of the world because you can do this. And other days you feel you're technically as bad as it can be. It is what it is, you know. But ultimately, you, you know, for me, I set you know, I really set a number of goals. And you know, my, my goal is you know, to become a safe transplant surgeon at the end of two years and recognize what my limits were and what I could do and offer. South Africa, and I think I'm quite honestly, I'm quite, quite happy uh, um, to achieve that. You know, uh, there's certainly many challenges. You know, train, you know, you're going to train for the rest of your life. You're going to be training until you retire, and you're going to be as good as the last case you ever did. You know, it is what it is. Um, but for, I find it extremely challenging because you now into Toronto. Get used to a new system, new way of doing things, um, and also starting a family. I mean, that was extremely hard. My, you know, my wife had taken a hiatus from her medical training. We had a, a daughter that we had to, you know, we had to care for and look after. So trying to balance your work and your life is extremely challenging. It's already challenging to start with, but then you throw in a different environment, different weather. Getting used to a new healthcare system, sometimes it can be nightmarish. Would I do it again? Um, definitely yes. Um, would I want it to be easier? Probably not, because then I would have, I would have learned anything, nothing. You've gone there and you just trained and everything would be smooth when you come back. For me, you're not a better surgeon that way. Look, if it's uh, if it's meant to be easy, then there's something. Either you're extremely talented or it happens. There are people who are super talented who can do it all. Uh, or you, know, you haven't trained enough. It's, it's, it's all you, you know, people say, oh, you're a general surgeon. Is that, is that good enough? I mean, to be a good general surgeon, it's extremely difficult. Extremely, extremely difficult. To be just a good, well trained general surgeon is hard. You know, to run a solo practice as a private surgeon is extremely hard. It's very humbling at times. Uh, I'm certainly not in private practice. So, you know, I would love myself as an academic surgeon. I think I would spend the rest of my life in a, in a university setting, but uh, I, think, I think training, surgical training, is not easy. Uh, we acknowledge that. Um, but I always use the word scenic journey, and I think everyone needs to do that. Uh, my mentor certainly took me over. That's what I got out of my mentor. You need to really enjoy every step of the way, meet people, um, 
there will be a certain age where you'll be established. This is what I want to do. For some people, I want to do a bit of everything. Okay, so a lot of people say, oh, yeah, I want to do this. This is the niche procedure I prefer. And that makes me happy and I get good results and I offer great care. That's also good. It's important for people to, you need to get influence. You need to have the right influence. When I talk about influence, it needs mentorship in a way. But you also need to have a mind of your own, you know, a vision of your own, and you need to find your path. What is right for me might not be right for the rest of the people in this room, and vice versa. I said, I'll be here this time. So, with the, with the challenging field that you mentioned, so you said, you mentioned that it was quite competitive to get into. Um, what do you think you did that kind of like pushed you, put you in the best possible position to get placement? That's a tough one. You know, I think uh, you know, that's a really hard one. I, I, I don't think there was one particular thing. I think it was more uh, collection of things. And I've got no doubt that you know, being trained by the best people and getting the right mentorship was good. But you know, I always try to do a bit extra. So I did a fair amount of research you know, during medical school and after medical school to try and get into uh, residency, registrar time. I think it's uh, today it's practically impossible to get into a registrar program if you don't have a published abstract or an article or a presented at the those are all part and parcel of, of, of registrar recruitment. You know, and often people, you know, the misconception we have is that, you know, if you're not doing research in a high tech lab or looking under the microscope, then it's not research. Well, it's not true. There are many things you can do, um, whether it's lab based research or clinical research or public health research related to surgery or investigating the, uh, um, uh, how our surgeons behave in the OR, or you know, personalities in surgery, it can be extremely broad. You know, whatever you, you bring that you can, you know, if you contribute something to science or to, to uh, uh, the bank of knowledge that we have already, if it, even if it's a tiny, small contribution, it is a contribution. And for me, every single piece of research is valuable. We often listen, often listen to a talk and we hear people who listen next to you saying, oh, that was really boring. I mean, that's not the truth. It might be boring for you, but you know, I'm going to gain something out of it and gain a new perspective and find something interesting. Um, yeah, I would say research is probably one of the biggest things. And I've met a lot of people out there on these projects. Uh, yeah, the, the, and the second thing was working in the right place. I worked in some very uh, non-glamorous places in the early stages of my career. You know, I worked in rural hospitals and you know, community service was in the middle of nowhere. Um, but it was extremely valuable. You know, kind of try and get independent, some basic surgical things, procedures that you do. Uh, and, and by the time you get to registrar time, you at the correct level to train even more. Just to move on to um, more about your career now, um, especially now with our present time, we're obviously facing a COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. So yeah. just like how has that impacted your career? Um, you know, when I was, I was training in Canada when COVID happened, and uh, you know, our program quickly adapted to that. We certainly stopped doing elective surgery, we stopped doing cancer surgery. We were still doing transplant time. By well, the time I finished my training in, in, in August uh, 2020, um, I made the decision to go home a bit back to my homeland of Mauritius and spend some time with my family. But uh, there was also COVID there. But within every challenge, you must try and find an opportunity. It's very important to realize that. So you might find a challenge, but you might hold on to it. I can make something out of this. When I went there, I uh, 
one of our main goals was that to Mauritius had a extremely high rate of, uh, of renal failure. You know, we had about 1,600 people on hemodialysis. Uh, a kidney transfer program needed to be rebooted. In fact, Prof Khan went and started a tertiary kidney transplant to Mauritius. So I went back and I kind of helped uh, trying to restart our kidney program, um, seeing how we get our patients ready for when COVID is better or uh, more controlled, how we could you know, get transplantation going. And I think the most important thing was, or for me, was to be a public health uh, practitioner. That's what I think I was in the past four months. I gave talks to a lot of people, to members of society, the general public, um, looked into the organ donation law in Mauritius. And I must say, we made quite a lot of progress. I think by next year, we should be restarting kidney transplants quite quickly. Um, I, I, for me, that might be one of my, you know, a global surgery project for me. Um, I might reach a surgeon from, from Cape Town. Um, often people say, oh, it's COVID, it's all over. I think, uh, I think there's a lot you can do in COVID. Uh, we could, you know, the things we started doing in COVID that will probably stay like this forever. You know, we, we a, lot of, a number of us were doing video conferences for patient clinics and they were perfectly fine. You know, so looking at outcomes of whether video conferencing works for patient surveillance, you might, you might find that it's extremely helpful. And post-COVID, that, that might be the way that we look at patients. You know, it might work extremely well. The way in which we examine students has not changed. You know, certainly when I was, when I was training in North America, you know, they had, uh, the way in which the board certified from uh, the general surgeons has not changed. You know, there's just an, uh, a written examination. There was no moral component. We might keep it that way, I'm not sure. But it's, it's going to bring new perspectives to how we, we do things. Right? Some of them might be very good, some of them might not work. We might need to go back to our old way of doing things. But, uh, I, I, you know, COVID, COVID is a real tragedy. Right? We've lost many lives and many people were sick. It's also showed you where our lacking is on. If you're part of the world news now, basic things like oxygen, major things, massive pandemic, and people are not surviving upstairs and even of oxygen. You know, I think we as a, uh, you know, I often say, you know, even if you become a surgeon or whatever, it's, it's, it's very important that you become a, an activist or an advocate for your patients. You need to bring some. You know, societal contribution is very important. You know, so uh, today we might argue that uh, it's important that we look at our basics. Right? If we learn from other countries, how are we going to deal with another wave? You know, are we going to, all of us are vaccinated, are we going to vaccinate more people? Is prevention enough? Are we going to stop making our own vaccines? You know, those are, those are, those are important things we we'll need to learn from this crisis. But uh, I think we should look at it as a hindrance. So we're going to have, this is not the last pandemic we're going to have. And we're going to brace ourselves, we're going to have another one one day. Whether it's five or ten years from now. But you just hope that we're brave enough for it. And um, what, so what are your plans going forward? And how has COVID nineteen kind of impacted? Um, look, I, you know, when I came, you know, when I came back to Cape Town, I was supposed to come back. With it. I wasn't sure whether I was going to accept a job here uh, or somewhere else in the country. It certainly impacted on my training. Look, I'm married. I don't, this is going to happen to most of you and have a partner or somebody in your life that you may, but who also has a career. You know, it's an important consideration to have a family, kid, a kid. Um, certainly getting back to South Africa, whether it was Cape Town or Chelmsford or whatever, was lengthy, it was delayed. Although, you know, as I said, I didn't make something out of it in, in, in Mauritius. I don't think in the long term it will really matter. Got a, you know, the 
the way I do it is I have a five-year plan at a big stage of my life. And I still I still think that I'm you know well at all where I want it to be uh, to be at. Um, I think I think in five years from now I see myself as an established uh, you know, in this institution. Um, and having established some more hybrid procedures, um, or hopefully some novel electronic patients. And that could be in the public or private markets, whichever you know, works out the best. And could you just um, tell us like, what goes on the daily makings of the life? Like a snapshot of just a day in the life. What would the day? Um, it's organized chaos. So it often starts at 5, 5.30 in the morning. Uh, it starts with my daughter trying to wake us up very often before the alarm clock. Um, it's having a quick breakfast and just trying to make sure that uh, the kid gets ready for school. Um, and then it's the drive to work and often try and catch up with my parents who have overseas by driving. Without a handheld phone, as I can see. Um, and then as soon as I get to work, it's uh, a war drawn in the morning. Um, and then we, I think one of the most important parts of the day is just sitting down and having a coffee with the team, maybe like about 15 20 minutes, to sort of catch up on the previous day's work and what's going to happen throughout the day. Then it's often uh, either a substantial clinic, a big clinic, or operating or dealing with emergencies um, and it really depends often the day will finish at four or five but sometimes the day will never finish and it just carries on until early hours in the morning and I, and I get home and start again but in between all of this I try and make sure that I have a chat with other registrars I'm helping with you know, the research uh, or medical students uh, Make sure that my own research doesn't fall backwards. I have some time to pen a few ideas down, send a few emails, um, see what conferences are coming up, I might do that. And most important is uh, chatting to my boss, my current boss at the moment, my head of unit, um, seeing how we can improve things and what ideas we have for the future. So what are we going to tackle with a, if there's a next wave of, of COVID? You know, I think, uh, yeah, that's generally how the day goes. Of varies, you know, often if they're international meetings, then we're, we're trying to present and make sure that there are not people left behind to run the program or run the unit. Um, so, you know, it varies, it's never the same. You have to adapt a lot. I think uh, in the medical career, whether it's surgical or non surgical, you always have to make a plan that their teams are changing. Patients are not a constant factor, right? Even if they're a constant factor in terms of being in your ward, their health isn't. Often they're doing well, some of the days they're not doing well at all, or some days they have a procedure and they have complicated. You know, it's, uh, it's the nature of surgery. Um, but I, I, I think that's one, for me, that would be one of the highlights of my career, is that I don't have a, I'm a man of certain age, I'm so happy to reasonably happily come to work every day. Uh, and I know I won't be doing the same thing. You know, we often in vascular surgery, what's very interesting is we, we often have to design a specific operation for a specific individual because they have a specific disease with 20,000 other specificities. You know, and for me, that's what really drew me to, to the field. And the transplantation is pretty much the same. You, you, you cannot offer a gen generic procedure uh, for these patients, it has to be well thought through. They're often very sick. That, for me, that makes my day really interesting. It's often very tired and exhausted. Uh, the other part of it is, I never knew this word before, until it's on my career, it's self-care. Right? It's good to work hard and do the best, uh, do, the, do things to the best of your ability, but it's important to look after yourself, look after your family, because otherwise you're not really good at what you do. It comes to work grumpy and inefficient, as efficient. I must say, I'm very lucky to have great colleagues at work. I've got you know, friends I've trained with as, as a registrar, I've got colleagues who from other parts of the world, and it makes 
by day of student interest. What's also interesting is, you know, we all have bad days. Uh, the good days are very good because you come back and feel on top of the world. But the bad days make you question everything. That's good because that's when you improve as a surgeon and you think maybe I'm not good enough as to this, I need to improve, or I need to go learn something overseas, or to go watch it even more. These are very important segments of one's uh, training and life. Sorry, I digress there, but I think it's an important <laughs> point to, to bring together. Yeah. And sorry, just to round off, um, but with all the highs and the lows that you've kind of experienced, and there's obviously a lot of challenges that come along with um, being in the medical career, um, what keeps you going? Um, <clears throat> I think it's my family. Yeah, I think. Uh, if I tell you it's, you know, it's my career, I'd be lying because, you know, if you, you know, you can't have a great career without a very supportive family. It's impossible. You know, we all, you know, particularly if your partner is in the same field, you often have to make sacrifices for each other. It can be very costly in terms of time and hours and years of training. For me, I think the number one priority now, you know, I, I never thought I would say that. If you asked me 10 years ago, I'd probably say my career, like this or that. Right now it's my family and making sure that whatever I do as a surgeon or whatever I achieve in my career is side by side with my family. Uh, I think I'm a real failure if I'm not a valuable member of society or if my you know, offspring or kid becomes a valuable member. I mean, that's my number one priority at the moment. And the ability to do everything else at the same time is what Hopefully it distinguishes the you know the good academic from the not so good academic to be able to balance all that. Yeah. Good, thank you. All right. So I'm just gonna ask you a few random reflective questions. Sure. Um so what does the future of surgery look like for you? Um look I, I from my point of view, I think the future of surgery is very um, exciting. Um, and it's not exciting because of what we're going to do for our patients in the future. I think it's exciting because of the number of people we see who are not interested in the field, because of the quality of registrars we're currently recruiting, and uh, because of uh, you know the flux of new ideas that may result because of that. For me, I think that what is that, that is exactly what is, is is going to make surgery more interesting in the future. And you know, certainly from a technically from a technical point of view, it's the uh, you know this is this is now the area of minimally invasive surgery. We're going to see more and more operations being done by very tiny incisions, whether it's with a, a lap scope or a robot. You know, certainly for me, who's somebody from a, from a quite a non-traditional uh, pathway of training, I'm, I'm currently in the vascular unit. Uh, at the moment, 75% of all our work is, is with the new technology. It's all endovascular. Uh, and, I, and I only see that getting uh, you know, massive improvement in the quality of our stents and endovascular procedures over the next few years. And I'll be, I, I won't be surprised if over the next 10 years, we'll find that the great majority, so I would say above 90% of all our procedures in vascular surgery are done um, in the vascular. So with no big incisions uh, and endoluminal, as we say, so sort of interventions from the inside of the blood vessels. So I think that's, you know, that's more or less where we see. Um, so, so, so certainly from a basic science point of view, um, I think we'll see big change in how we deal with cancer um, and, and big changes in how we modulate certain conditions just because of better drugs that we're going to see in the market. I don't think I'm going to see anything more, say anything more because I think it's much more technical. Uh, I want to create something that you said that you hope that the future of surgery is no surgery. Yeah, so I can't believe I said that, but it's true. <laughs> You Which agree. Is not part of a job. Yeah, yeah, I would look. I, I think if you, you know, 
certainly from from my point of view and what my training is, I'm a trained transport surgeon. And these operations we offer to these patients are brutal. They are massive incisions. Um, we call that organ replacement therapy. I often have to take out a liver that's diseased with all the bleeding. Put in an organ with the hope that they will survive the next day and then the many years to come. You know, when I say no surgery, is if we're able to prevent or survey properly. You know, like the classic example is patients who have colorectal cancer. If you if you read the literature from South Africa, you'll find out that a lot of the patients that we see in our clinic have advanced disease and and they're beyond cure. You can't offer them curative surgery. What you would want is to have a program where you survey people enough, so much so that uh, you can catch those lesions at a much, much earlier stage, and where you do a very tiny procedure, you can snare these procedures or through the scope address them, that the patients don't get you know cancer further down the line. So yeah, future of surgery would be no surgery. Well, but we know it's not the case. Um, surgery is here to stay. Um, I think traditional surgery is going to struggle. But I think those surgical disciplines that have embraced technology and have accepted that the future is otherwise and have recruited the right people to embrace that philosophy are going to do marvelously well. There's no question about it. And what would you say to aspiring surgeons who are looking to get into surgery? Um, kind of would and say to say something generic, but it will be. I think there's certain rules that uh, you, you cannot. That those are the non-negotiable rules. And certainly, when I you know speak to people who are interested or who firm to advice, they're pretty much the same. The one important thing, and you know, Professor Paniri who works here used to say, is to be a good doctor. I think that's one of the very important things is to be honest and to treat your patients as truthfully as possible, to do it to the best of your ability. Um, and, and you should never, it's a very really humbling specialty, you should never ever feel that you cannot phone somebody to ask for advice because you will look stupid. It's very important. That's one of the most important things, you know, anybody who, who wants to embrace a you know, surgery career, it's one of the most important things you should, you should adopt is humility, the willing to, willingness to call people for help or to ask for advice. You know, and you often find people are always keen to do that. Um, uh, to understand uh, that we are you know, rapidly evolving um, a discipline, that we need to learn every day. Obviously, you're only really as good as the last case you'll ever do all your time. Um, and it's to work hard. Um, and there are two other things that I've learned from my previous mentors, to mentor other people and to do good quality research. Um, good quality research doesn't mean having a $10 million grant, otherwise you can't do it. Good quality research means that you do something that's meaningful enough get some change in the current system to improve care of our, care of our patients um, yeah. and also it, you know a small project you know often can lead to something bigger you know we currently have registrars out there who started with very small projects who now make their PhDs it's very valuable work so I would say you know, all of this honesty you know, being adaptable, um, extremely hardworking, the ability, being willing to, you know, always be willing to call for help or ask for advice, um, and research. Research, you know, is, you know, being inventive, that's, that's very important at this current time. Um, 
there's no quick fix. If you want a five year career, this is not it. You know, this is a scenic journey. Every new, um, every new uh, segment of your training or your learning or your becoming is is important. You've got to try and enjoy it as much as possible. One of the most important things now is whenever I travel or go for conferences, I try and make it a family event. So I will travel with my, with my wife and daughter and try and make something of out of every trip or every adventure we have. Um, yeah, I think that's the, the, the advice I'll give to myself. I, I, I must say, I don't think I'll do anything. Um, probably, you know, when I, when I went to Toronto, I realized I'd been. You know, practicing medicine on average seven years more than the, than the, other, the other fellow who I was working for. And I was okay with that. You know, just because I knew I was coming back here. And had I, had I spent less time, I would be less prepared. But some people might say, I need less time to do it. I do it that way. But every individual is different. So if in a team, if we all look the same, we have the same personality, we would not function. You, know, you, you need to have some common traits. Um, ambition is one of them. Everybody needs to ambition, ambitious, hardworking, but there needs to be a bit. Somebody might be a bit more eccentric than the other. Somebody else might be a bit more adventurous. One of the other team members might be a bit more conservative. But that's what makes a team. That's why you get the best results out of such a saying earlier that's why we chose you guys to run the society <laughs> a better vision than us you know it's uh, you know at that point when we started uh, I think our, our principal goals was to foster a, a culture of you know, surgical knowledge or interest amongst our medical students uh, you know from the beginning we said we were going to go with the university uh, universities are uh, core principles. We're going to respect them for their course. Transformation, you know, being more inclusive. Uh, at that time when I was training, gender is, for some odd reason, gender was an issue in surgery. Uh, you know, right now, we are seeing that there are more and more women in surgery. They are often better surgeons than, than their male counterparts. You know, and it's, it's, you know, it's what it's, it should be. I'm, I'm happy to see that we've, you know, when our first talks was women in surgical training, and Norman Stain was guest speaker, she's going to be the head of surgery at Tiger Blue. And it was very enlightening. And, you know, as a male, you often go, you train, you're juggling one portfolio. As a woman, it's hard. You, know, you often look at, and most of these, Especially what I see is most of these registrars should be joined the program with super women with different portfolios, managing at home, managing a family, they're coming through and they're doing their job, it's really inspiring. Uh, but you know, for me, the other thing with, with this society when it first started was to survive. And I keep on saying that, people often say, well, this is what was so much of a big issue. If you just, you know, done it, it would have, fun it would have functioned, you know, it wasn't the case. It was really, really hard to keep us, you know, to get to keep our heads above the water and you know, to ensure survival. But at that point, I think it was, you didn't have these massive goals like you have today. I think we wanted to make it work, we wanted to make it survive. But as I said, we wanted to make 100% sure that we had uh, better leadership.
Not really. I'm gonna say I've been quite privileged to. I'm not gonna say privileged. Say lucky to have to have met the right people and the right mentors to, to, to train. But I I've shared with many. Uh, and I've shared concerns with many people over the years and what I've seen and where I've trained that you know often there have been issues and we all recognise that. South Africa is a very young democracy. We haven't been here for long. Uh, and this is a work in progress. And the other thing is we, we have to be quite optimistic. You know, I see students from, I certainly come from a very different background. I didn't go to private school, I went to a normal public school. My parents were both from the very working class. Uh, my father was the first in the family to go to university, and my grandparents worked in the field. I come from a you know, I always say, if I can do it, anybody can do it. There's no question about it. You know? And uh, I pride myself on that. You know? I think uh, every time I give a talk, I give it a picture of my grandparents and what they did. Um, and there's a, for me, there's a huge element of pride to that. I know some people kind of show slides of their grandparents being famous surgeons. Good for them. You know, I come from a very, I say, non traditional background. Um, and I've got no doubt in my mind. Had I not come from there, I wouldn't have been there, I am so question about it. You know, it's, uh, you very often learn the very important principles from the from the grassroots of society that you can't gain at university. And I tell every student, you know, if you think you come from a, I grew up in a rural area of Zimbabwe initially, if you come from a rural area and you tell me, oh, I come from a rural area, I cannot do this, or I come from a very modest family, in fact, that is your strength. That is your strongest attire. You know, you've got to exploit this. You know, you've got to look carefully and see, you know, what you learn from there. And I can guarantee you that 99% of the time, it works out. It's good for you. I would never change anything about it. Never, never again. Never, never. I'm happy with where I come from. I think being from the working class has taught me a lot. Uh, and uh, look, I, I, I fully, and I discuss this a lot with the students when we have tutorials and so on. That's why I ask every student where they come from, what they call as class, and what they want to do later on. It's very important to gain that perspective from somebody who you're going to teach something to. And, and the answers are very interesting. But I would say I think it's a fantastic institution. There's a lot of work to be done, there's a lot of transformation yet to do. I want to be part of this journey, I want to be part of this, you know, this project, this country's project. Um, and uh, you know, we often say, oh, this is not going to turn out right, there's no way this is going to work. Well, it's worked. You know, a young democracy, nothing has gone awfully wrong over the years. Uh, there's still a lot to do and you know what happens in the future depends on us so embrace it you know and you have a daughter yeah would you want her to pursue a journey in medicine or surgery uh no i think i would want her to pursue a journey in what she thinks is best for her and where she will be the happiest i think if you're happy wherever you do i think uh, you can only be successful you know uh, I had colleagues certainly who left medical school after the second year who thought, uh, I had a very close friend who was kind of forced to go into medical school, extremely bright, but who actually loved numbers. Now an actual poor big firm in the country. So, you know, everybody has to find their own path. It's, uh, it's mentorship, right? How do you mentor your child to become the best person they you will know, become eventually? Um, no, I, I mean, you know, if she's influenced by us, they obviously influence the children. I was influenced by the uncle who was a, who was a physician who had a degree of influence in my family. But, uh, you know, you let them grow, you, you let them teach them how to do things right, and then they make their decision in the future. If it's surgery, if it's surgery, if it isn't something else, then it's also interesting. You can learn something new. You've had lots of mentors in your life. Yeah. I think we've, 
not saying anything. A lot of the members of the founding committee would say that. I think Del Khan is probably the ultimate mentor of that. He's still my mentor. I still phone him for advice. He's retired. I still phone him for advice when I want him to choose his job and what I would do. I'd ask him for advice. Although I do make an educated decision for myself at the end. He was a great mentor. And when I was uh, in Toronto, there was a Professor Sergio is now retired, Paul Greg, who was also a great mentor. You know, he's a great, great role model um, who, you know, kind of looked up to you and want to do something that's the way he used to do it. Um, it's also important for you as a, to grow as an individual. I can't say I want to be exactly like my mentor, but I want to do some things the way he did. But there's all, I've also got my ideas. Some of them are crazy and eccentric. But uh, you know, this is this is how we you know you evolve in surgery. If you want to make it, it's important to understand that if you if we want change in surgery and progress in surgery, if we have photocopies of mentors and mentees, it can't work. There will be no progress. You know, good mentorship is about unleashing the you know full potential of every candidate that comes to you. Might come to you, give them some good advice, but they have some very crazy and eccentric ideas about how they want to do things. Uh, and, and if you think they're reasonable enough as a mentor, um, then you've got to let them unleash it and see what happens. That's what happened a lot at this institution. You know, the first heart transplant is not a coincidence. And all the new things that are coming up in surgery at the institution is it's not because the mentors and the mentees did exactly the same thing, it's because the mentees chose to do something a bit non conventional. Yeah. And one last question just yeah. for our little committee. Yeah. What I know you um, when you were part of Surgical Society, once you left, you left completely. Yeah. So if you were to apply or have an interest in one of the portfolios now, what would it be? So we have obviously our executive, we have treasury, our general secretary, social media and marketing, community development, career development, research, global surgery, and workshops and talks. What would you, where's, where's, where's your passion in such a society? You want the honest answer? Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think I'd qualify for the committee. Because I think the committee is far ahead of what we were doing as committee members. And, uh, and I said that from the beginning, right? I just joke with the That's the case. I don't think I would fit. Maybe research would be one thing I would have you know, to look after and, and, and get involved with. But uh, I think it is much better than what it was more than 10 years ago. I think you're being kind to us. No, no, I'll be too. I, 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 I know. I mean, we started, we kind of know what we went through. Um, what, what, goes on, what goes on in the society now is just incredible. It's, uh, you, you've got to understand the magnitude of what's happening here. And there's no other society in the world that functions like this. I guarantee you that. It's a number of the membership volume, the uh, activities that you do, uh, you know, one of the most impressive things is the outreach, you know, what you do, the rural schools, try and convince students, you know, convince and try and guide them to getting into medical school, fostering an interest in medicine and surgery, I think that's unique, I don't think any other, any other society in the world does that, and, and it, it also, no other society in the world is in South Africa very important. Uh, we often say ah, it's a great society. One of the reasons for which it's a great society is because it's right here. It's you know, a wonderful country. It's because we have a society that's constantly changing. That we as surgeons in South Africa can't be the statu quo and behave or do things we used to do traditionally. We need to be highly inventive. 
you function in an environment that's constantly changing, that has these challenges that hit you face on every day. You know, and, uh, and I think that's very important to understand and value. You often hear surgeons coming from overseas and giving a talk, and you hear people next to you saying, oh, standards are really mediocre, it's not good enough. Well, there might be some element of truth to that. But as a surgeon who just gave the talk who comes to mind, sure, a great institution, they would not be able to function. It's very important to understand that. Our surgeons are really, truly a different breed. Make sure that, you know, things happen, that patients are cared for within the realms of, you know, of our society and our limitations is very important. You know, surgeons in this country are just not surgeons. They're good doctors, they're good advocates, they're good activists, they're good public health specialists. We need to be a bit of everything to get things going here. Uh, but I can tell you, when we get things right, we get them. We get them right. Very, very well. Very well. Yeah. Thank you for your little nuggets of wisdom. Pleasure. Good.